Welcome again to another episode of the uh, Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast, the world's longest running medical podcast. And um, uh, we've got um, Kristen here from uh, uh, from uh, UC Davis in Sacramento in California. And uh, she was given uh, award as one of the leading uh, research uh, projects that were awarded at the society, recent Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting or virtual meeting, <laughs> um, <laughs> where we can call that came from. But congratulations. Um, Thank you. Um, um, now, uh, Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, and where you work? Yeah. So my name's Kristen. I work at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento, California. Um, actually from Oregon, so a little town in Oregon. Came here for my training initially. Um, loved the hospital, it seemed like a great fit, so I ended up staying, and I've been with them for a little over six years now. Um, and I was one of the four techs picked to kind of launch the Explorer once it uh, came to our city and was installed. So I've been working at the Explorer for mm, just over two years now. Right. And through that, it's you know given us ample opportunity to kind of work with the actual research group that was involved with the building and the, the background of the Explorer. And that's kind of how we got into writing these abstracts and these you know research projects. So um, it was actually my senior author, Yasser, who initially saw these defects in the, the blanching article that we wrote, um, had no idea what they were. And I took a look and that's kind of how we got started on the blanching defect. Right, a little bit more background. We've done, we talked on the podcast about um, about uh, the Explorer scanner. We talked to Simon Cherry a couple of times going back mm -hmm. uh, uh, nearly nine years now um, to talking about uh, when that first wow. started. And, um, and uh, it's really the only true whole body scanner, really, from head to, head to toe in terms, of, in terms of that. There's a couple of other large field of view scanners mm -hmm. that out there. There's the one at Penhead and... And then there's uh, Siemens have got a um, head scanner, but the um, but the one that you've got is the only really true whole body from uh, uh, head to toe. And, right. Uh, so I just put putting that in, in a little a little bit of uh, background there for the listener. Um, so um, you talked uh, on on this you um, you talked about blanching defects. Tell us a bit about what you mean by a blanching defect. Yeah, so we were looking at these images and we were discovering, especially on superficial you know, skin tissue areas, that there was a photopenic area presenting. So area with no uptake, um, which we kind of just started calling blanching defects. But we weren't really sure if that, you know, similar to conventional scanners, when you have a little bit of movement, it creates what you kind of call an eraser artifact, where there's just a whole section of no counts and, you know, can be due to scatter reconstructions. So um, we were trying to determine if it had to do with movement, what it had to do with. And I started noticing that it was um, common in certain areas, you know, next to bony structures, such as the sacrum, you know, the heels. And so I started thinking it had to do with pressure points. Right. So it was on the inferior side of the body, right? Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So that, that's a bit of a giveaway rather than yep. uh, where it's joining, right? So it's on the inferior side of the body. So, yep, yep, go on. So we took um, two different groups of subjects. The first were healthy volunteers that we were using already, um, just because we weren't sure with the Explorer being the first in the world, you know, dynamic whole body scans, what is normal and what's not. So um, we took images from these healthy volunteers. Um, and then as well as uh, we had a group of flucyclovine patients there for prostate cancer who uh, signed up for another research study. So we, re we reviewed those images to just see how often these you know, blanching defects were occurring, if it had to do with age, weight, height, sex, you know, what it could be related to. Um, and after reviewing it, you know, we had on the first group, 80%, on the second group, 84% of subjects had these blanching defects in at least one location. Uh, so it doesn't really seem to be excluded by BMI, anything like that. Although, um, because it occurred more often in that second group, they did have a higher uh, BMI ratio on average. They were older. So um, it could have an effect. We, we haven't studied that far to see if, um, you know, maybe we'll do another population of 
of slightly older people to see if it occurs more frequently. Um, but it seems to be something that occurs at all age groups, you know, young people in their 20s all the way through. We have people in their 60s and 70s. Um, well, how long are people on the bed? In your, I mean, the scans are quite quick on the Explorer, aren't they? But how long? Uh, are they? For the dynamic studies and the healthy subjects, we did a 60 minute dynamic. So wow. they were on for quite a while. And then the flu cyclamine patients, it's about 24, 25 minutes. Um, so it was standard scan for flu cyclamine. Um, but we did notice um, on the healthy subjects because they actually returned for delayed imaging at 90 minutes and three hours that the blood flow at least partially or fully restored itself in those areas. So it seems to be something that once they are able to get up and move around, um, that we then see those artifacts disappear. Right. Well, now that you mention it, I, 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 uh, I, I think I've seen a similar artifact at the back of the head when I'm looking for, 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 for studies where um, I've got brain studies where, there, where there's a high uptake in the skull. So mm -hmm. particularly in tau compounds like NK, which has got a lot of high uptake in the scalp, that, that where, where someone's lying on the head, the back where they're lying, you, you see that see a lack of uptake where the, where the back of the head is, is lying. And I presume you saw a blanching defect there as well, did you? Um, yeah, we saw a lot around the skull, um, but again, mostly just on the dynamic images. When you're talking about someone who is injected upright and didn't have those pressure points, um, we're less likely to see it when they lie down because you already have uptake in that area. Um, so we don't really typically see it, you know, for our standard studies where they're injected in the uptake room. But anything injected on the scanner where there was already pressure before the injection, that's when we tend to see the, the defects. Okay. Well, I mean, that's important because you don't want to have these defects mistaken for a pathological process. Absolutely. And that's why our physicians reviewed the CT images for any masses that could be causing these photopenic or necrotic type areas. Right. Um, was it thought that perhaps they might be useful for, um, for actually picking up pathology, for example, people who are liable to get pressure sores or things like that? Is, is, that, is there a thought that that might happen? Yeah, so um, that is kind of where the papers kind of go in the future, I think, is uh, can we use it for mechanopathological purposes, you know, such as pressure ulcers, um, even evaluating different materials that could relieve pressure ulcers. Um, one of the techs actually suggested, because we did get an aftermarket cushion on our scan table, um, we haven't reviewed the data fully to determine if it's helped, but we're still seeing these defects. So is there another material out there uh, that would help alleviate pressure points. And somebody mentioned maybe trying out the purple mattress, you know, that one on TV right now, at least in America, it's called a purple mattress and they use oh, a, a grid that's, um, it's not foam, it's not a spring, but it's this, I don't know, this weird kind of grid material. And so someone suggested, hey, trying that out, see if it's actually what is it, what a they gel or something, is it? Or it's kind of like a gel, but it's, it's um, well, if you like think of a collimator in a way, it's got all these little holes in it. But the septum material is this kind of gel. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No, oh, I haven't seen that. Well, I guess, um, uh, uh, yeah, we don't, we, don't have, we don't have that. We don't see that advertisement on television. It's, it's for a... No, but yeah, in the States. It's big in the States. Right. I've heard about the My Pillow guy, but I'm assuming... The My Pillow guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's different for, for other reasons, I think. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, okay. So that, that that so that's quite interesting. I guess there are some lessons learned here. But taking back what you're saying is that is that um, although that's unavoidable for some things, um, you probably don't want to be injecting people lying down, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're not doing a dynamic study, definitely don't inject them lying down, or at least try to get them in a position where they're less likely to get pressure points. Right. You're still going to get a pressure point on the bottom, though, aren't you? It, yeah, um, but because for a lot of people, the, the bottom is a little less bony from, you know, the top of the sacrum, um, I think that you're, you'd be less likely to actually get a pressure point in those areas because um, we only see it in the sacrum, the heels, the, where the scapula hits the table and the uh -huh. skull. Mm, okay. um, other areas would be like maybe a strap if a strap's too tight on the arm, uh, but generally, you know, on the actual gluteus part or your, your thighs, you know, 
where you have a lot of cushion or meat, uh, we're not seeing those pressure points as much. Right. Do you see it on the belt line or the brass strap or those sorts of areas? Um, no, actually. And most of our patients, you know, especially women, if they've got the underwire, the, the metal clasps, they have to remove them. Sure. Uh, but even for our normal studies, we don't see it. Um, however, we have seen tube sock artifact. So oh, yeah, yeah. men who have the tall tube socks, you can actually see um, the compression and a slightly decreased blood flow in that area. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe that's also you could use it to assess um, um, thrombosis stockings, for example. That sort of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah, so you want to turn a, uh, make lemons out of lemonade in that respect. You can use it for a lot of things like that, I would have thought. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. Oh, okay, so how many people were involved in this study altogether? Uh, as far as subjects? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I think there were about 30 in the first research group and 28 or so, 24 in the second research group. So that's a goodly number. For this sort of study, so yeah, uh, yeah. So I think I think that's pretty definitive. Yeah, excellent. Yep. Well, it sounds like a really interesting little research project, but it also it also uh, means that we've got to think about with these new types of scanners, in particular, they're way more sensitive. Um, they're going to pick up smaller defects, um, mm -hmm. and I think we did when people started to use F minor F eighteen. Uh, sodium fluoride for bone scans, for example, as opposed mm -hmm. to using um, uh, you know, uh, 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 technician for bone scans. Um, we had we had did a lot of that in Australia because we ran out of uh, molybdenum. We had a molybdenum shortage, so our our government insurance, uh, which covers everybody, not just the elderly, still called Medicare in Australia, um, allowed people to use the to instead of uh, if they were booked in for a bone scan to actually get a fluorine 18 PET scan for the same price, if you like. Okay. And um, um, and so we there was, you know, huge numbers of people having the bone scans done with fluorine 18. Well, of course, it's not the same as another bone scan and there were, had people had, and things that looked pathological were actually not pathological. Right. This is another example, I think, of that, is where you, where you have better technology, better technology, Sometimes means you to see normal things that aren't apparent, and, and this is that, that, that might be perceived as a, as a pathological condition. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's that's really good. anything else you'd like to add about what you've done, or where you're going to head next? You're going to, you did talk a bit about that. You said about using it for picking up pressure sores and things like that. Um. So we're in the process of actually submitting. Um, more of a manuscript, you know, a full manuscript on this blanching defect. Um, just kind of seeing where that goes. Now, I'm not able to submit my own research study. I don't have a grant or anything, but um, I am hopeful that it'll get picked up, whether it's, you know, Simon Cherry or someone in our facility um, who wants to be the point person on a, a new research study involved in that kind of thing. But I mean, right now we've got our hands so full with other, other studies, you know, we're doing zirconium T-cell, um, for COVID, you know, we're doing some inflammation studies. So I'm um, just kind of excited to see where these new studies take us and where we go from here. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, no, that, that sounds that sounds good. I mean, you, I, I know you're doing lots of interesting stuff. I think I've got a, a friend of mine who is looking to doing multiple sclerosis looking at inflammation on the, on the, on the, on the scan. So um, um, from... Uh, uh, from uh, someone from San Diego, so I think there's a there's a, um, there's a lot of uh, aspects of looking at those things, but part of that is is to is to work out what's normal and what isn't. So, so, right. so um, uh, it's it's nice to see zirconium being used too. That's a that's uh, that's a good tracer for your T cells. Maybe we need to talk about that because it's longer half life. T cells take longer to get there. You need to take kind of much match by doing it so yeah, yeah, excellent. yeah. really good um anything else you want to add, add to that or or whatever i don't no? think so unless you have any more questions no but uh i thought that was interesting uh, thank you very much for taking the time to take part in the podcast um and um and uh 
hopefully we'll catch up in person. Maybe maybe next year the things will, will have calmed down a bit, but uh, I can get yeah. to the uh, to the next site of nuclear medicine meeting, which is in Vancouver, isn't it? So I believe it is. Yeah, that would be nice. It would be nice to meet up with you. Thank right. you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you.